Chapter 40 Stafford looked askance. Are you sure? Yes, said Jim. It's the simplest solution. Stafford glanced at Jane, then back at him. Very well. Where did you put them? I pawned them, said Stafford. It seemed the only solution in the circumstances. Jim gasped. Pawn them? Yes. Cool, said Jane. What did you get for them? Do you really wish to know? You can get them back, can't you? asked Jim. Of course. Thank goodness for that. Are you certain you want to do this? said Stafford, disappointment in his face. Yes, it's just too dangerous. I think we're all hanging by a thread, said Jim. I'm going to call the professor and tell him to pick them up tomorrow. Then we'll be shot of the whole mess. After that, Jane and I are going to fly to Washington Dulles so I can see her off. Stafford nodded with an element of reluctant agreement. I'll collect the items first thing tomorrow morning. Jim felt a welling sense of relief. He could tell he was making the right decision by his sudden mood change. Cutting a trading loss early felt like that. The relief was based on the understanding of the bad things the future would hold if you held on. Deep down, he knew he had to give the regalia back unconditionally. Chapter 41 Mushi Mushi, said Akira, answering his phone. Ah, Evan-san, good to hear from you. Why was the man calling him so soon after they had last spoken? Had something else happened? Something terrible? Professor, I've got some good news. Good news, repeated Akira, a wave of confusion sweeping over him. Had Evan's son given the regalia to the British Museum? Or indeed, thrown it into the sea? You can come and get the jewels tomorrow morning. Just come around the house and pick them up. Say again, please. You can come and get your treasures tomorrow. I'm giving them to you. Akira leaped up from his chair. You are giving them up? Yes. Akira wanted to ask why, but he didn't. He tried to imagine what Jim was thinking that he could hand them over for nothing. Anxieties raced through his mind. What was he going to do with them once he had them? He had planned to take them to the embassy, but now, with killers on the loose, that wasn't a simple matter. Hello, said Jim. Are you still there? Akira snapped out of his shock. Yes, yes, he felt a little weak and sat down again. Evan's son, what time shall I call on you? Eleven o'clock should be fine. Thank you so very much. No problem, said Jim, and hung up. What a crazy trade, he said, grimacing. All this excitement, and bugger all to show for it. Look on the bright side, said Jane, giving him a hug from behind. You got a groovy dueling scar out of it. You're right. I've always wanted one on my head to add to the collection. Chapter 42 Hi, said Akira, meaning yes. Tomorrow morning, I plan to pick up the regalia. He nodded to the caller far away in Tokyo. Hi, there is no further payment involved. Hi, Evan's son will give me all three objects. He was standing to attention in his small, tired hotel bedroom. I will need a guard to transfer them to the embassy. He was nodding. Twenty people seems more than adequate. Will they be armed? He was listening intently. May I suggest that only legitimately armed guards be used? We should avoid embarrassment. He groaned. Only three armed attachés available? I see. Would enlisting British help be too difficult? I see. I appreciate you will do all you can to help me. His face was locked in a mask of pain. Tokyo could not act fast enough. They could not ask for help. They did not have the right people in London and he had to act in the morning. He stiffened himself. All he had to do was pick up the regalia in the presence of three armed guards and get it five miles to the embassy. It was a stressful prospect, but it would surely end well. Thank you, he said to the compliments from Tokyo. Goodbye. Chapter 43 Excuse me, sir, said Stafford back in his official cover role as butler. Yes, said Jim, turning away from his computer. Jane looked up from her book on Burma. Professor Nakabashi just walked past our front door. Stafford looked down at his iPhone. There he is again. Jim got up and stared at the screen. 
Akira's form was disappearing up the road. I'll go and see what he's up to. The fence was made of plywood and painted blue. Akira could see through the cracks into the construction site beyond. From the evidence of rigs poking out above the barrier, excavation was going on, and he could see snatches of it. He paid attention to the details, the street, and the alleyways that led off it. He turned the corner and jumped. Evan's son was looking at him quizzically. Oh, he said, bowing, you surprised me. What the hell are you doing, said Jim, as genially as he could. Yes, yes, said Akira, very good question. He squinted hard at Jim. I am learning the lie of the land. Tomorrow I can't leave anything to chance. I am walking the route between your house and the embassy. He held up his phone. I'm taking notes and photographs. I want to leave nothing to fortune. Oh, said Jim, good thinking. Thank you, said Akira. I am a little frightened, I must admit. What happened to you could happen to me. He smiled nervously. I'm not big and strong like you. He clenched the fist of his short hand. I only have this arm to fight back with, he said, swinging the blow five inches by pushing out his shoulder. He immediately regretted his joke. Jim was smiling. Sorry to bug you, he said. I'm a bit wound up right now. I understand, said Akira. I am likewise wound up. Jane was walking towards them. Hi there, guys. What's up? The professor's casing the area for tomorrow's pickup, Jim told her. Akira bowed to her. Good job, said Jane. Why don't we all do dinner tonight? They looked at her as if she had said something either really clever or really dumb. I'm getting bummed out being cooped up day and night, she said. Okay, said Jim. I'm up for it. What would they do if he refused, wondered Akira. Would it be a big insult? Would they change their minds about giving up the regalia? What would happen if it all went terribly wrong? Would they be safe? Would he be safe? Were the regalia safe? How about you, Akira-san, said Jane. The woman Jane was excessively forceful, even for an American, but she sent an exciting shiver down his spine. Yes, he said. Please allow me to entertain you tonight. The trees of Green Park and the traffic of Piccadilly are all that separates the Japanese embassy from Buckingham Palace. Half Moon Street is around the corner, and partway down there is a Japanese restaurant called Kiku. Quality and proximity to the embassy means it is very popular, and Akira decided it would accomplish two purposes. It was a place to eat, and going there would offer him a chance to check out the area directly around the embassy before dinner. He had arranged to meet Jim and Jane there at seven, and had then carried on his research finally walking the whole way back to the embassy along his chosen route of the next day's vital mission. London would be so much nicer, he was sure, if only it was cared for a little better. Nothing was quite finished. The pavements were never properly flat. The trees were badly pruned and often vandalized, the grills around their trunks not perfectly set. Chewing gum was left stuck to the paving. There was graffiti, and like any backward country, litter. London was scruffy. It amazed him that no one saw the benefit of just a little more diligence and attention. London could shine like a jewel, such as Kyoto. Instead, it was dog-eared and splattered with besmirching corrosion. He didn't understand why. Chapter 44 Jane was poking the razor clam with her chopsticks. It seemed to be curling up in response. This is real fresh, she noted. Akira nodded. Do you like it? Jane was chewing. Very good, she said a few moments later. A waitress put down three lidded porcelain mugs set in wicker baskets. A glazed cartoon creature adorned the lids. A smiling ball-shaped fish. It looked a little like a very fat whale. The waitress took out a matchbox and struck a match. She took the top off Akira's mug and ignited the liquid, which quickly sputtered out. Some black and gray flakes were floating in the clear liquid below. Fugu sake, said Akira, happily. Now she lit Jim's drink. There was a puff of blue flame. Jane smiled. Europeans served women first, but with Asians, men took priority. Americans had lost the gender plot almost entirely. Tincture of neurotoxins, she said, saluting. Exciting. Kampai, said Akira. What is this, said Jim, clinking his cup with Jane and Akira. Fugu, said Akira. Puffer fish fins in hot sake. 
Lethal puffer fish fins in hot alcohol, said Jane, and sipped. Right, said Jim, adjusting his bandage. The liquid was bitter and heady. The fascinating solvent, like fumes of the sake, mixing with the bitter but intangible kick of the fins with their magic neurotoxin. A bit of liver from this fish and you drop dead on the spot, said Jane. That flavor is a tiny trace of one of the world's most powerful poisons shooting up the nerve ends in your tongue to your brain. Not so much poison, I'm sure, said Akira, though accidents do happen, but not with the fins. Tastes great, doesn't it? said Jane. Jim was trying to notice the effects of the potentially lethal toxins in his mouth. It just tasted pleasantly harsh to him, rather like a big sniff of spray glue. What's that? he asked, gesturing at a pile of orange stuff wrapped in a black papery substance. Sea urchin egg, said Akira. Very good. Jim picked it up with his chopsticks and got it into his mouth rather inelegantly. He nodded in appreciation. He wanted to say, it tastes very eggy, but if he had, he would have likely sprayed the professor with it. He washed it down with his toxic fish fin toddy. How would I know if I'd been poisoned? You get paralyzed, said Jane. So, 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 said Akira. You suffocate, she said. You're wide awake, but you can't breathe. It's like about ten people a year die from fugu in Japan. Right, Professor? Akira nodded. Very little chance of dying from eating fugu. More people die from bowing accidents in Japan than from eating blowfish. You know a lot about Japan, Jane-san. Thank you, said Jane. I wish. Die from bowing, said Jim, wondering whether the pufferfish poison had got into his ears. Smashing your head when you do it, said Jane, or getting it trapped in a train door. You know the kind of thing. Enough people doing anything is going to result in fatalities. Tens of thousands of people die every year just getting in and out of the bath. That's good to know, said Jim. I'm sticking to the shower from now on. What do you think, said Jim, as soon as the cab pulled away? He's legit, said Jane. He's quirky, but no gangster. Did you notice that every time we put him on a spot, his funny hand would start flexing or making a fist or something? No, said Jane. Really? His face is like pretty much blank all the time, and his funny hand does all the talking. Jane scowled. I totally missed that. I could be wrong, said Jim. What did it tell you? He's totally terrified. His hand was like screaming in panic every time we mentioned anything to do with the regalia. You can't blame him. I can't say I'm feeling brave myself, said Jim. Chapter 45 The full moon beamed down like a searchlight on the river, illuminating the scene with a clear, colorless light. The Thames glittered in charoscuro, the water shimmering like the scales of a fish. There was a sharp banging noise. Stafford awoke. His phone was ringing. He took a second to realize where he was in his new position at the top of the house in the granny flat. He picked the phone up and tried to turn the lights on. The power was out. The general alarm should have gone off. Good grief, he said, pulling open the bedside table drawer and hauling out his pistol. Men were piling out of a black RIB outside and racing up the ladder towards the lounge. Get into the bathroom and lock the door, Jane was shouting at Jim, a gun in her hand. No, said Jim. From the noise, a lot of people were coming their way. Just do it! No, said Jim. All right, she said. Stafford looked out of his doorway. He couldn't see anything in the dim glow of the emergency lighting. There was a burst of cracks and whistles, and he dodged inside his room as the wall and door frame erupted under a hail of bullets. Gosh, he heard himself cry out. He braced himself, put his arm outside, and fired two shots. Jim resisted the urge to look towards where the gunshots were coming from. He could hear feet thudding down the hall. The door burst open and Jane opened fire, the first figure tumbling forwards. She shot the second. There was a report from the doorway, and something struck her. She collapsed to the floor. Jim ran to her. There was another shot, and something sharp slapped Jim's arm. A flash of white light lit his world, and he felt a twist of agony. He was stricken and powerless with pain. A black figure, crowned with night sights, bent down and jabbed a hypodermic into Jane's thigh, then another into Jim. The figure pulled the taser round out of Jane and threw her over his shoulder. The other taser shooter dropped his weapon and helped up the second figure Jane had shot. He had been saved by a bulletproof vest, 
The first man into the room had a bullet between his eyes and was going nowhere. Stafford had barely put his arm out of the door before the next salvo whined past it. He snatched his hand back in. He heard running downstairs. They were leaving. He listened hard. There it was, movement from the man at the foot of the stairs. He swung out and let off three rounds. There was a muffled cry. He ducked back. A boat engine was roaring outside. Stafford slammed the door and hurriedly closed the latch. He ran to the window and threw it up. A figure was jumping into the RIB with Jane on his shoulder. He couldn't see Jim. There were seven figures and Jane. He took aim at one of the RIB's twin engines and fired. Torchlight swung and he ducked back. The window erupted into a shower of broken glass. He shielded his face. He ran to cover and peered out. The RIB was tearing away through the shadows along the Thames. Stafford picked his way through the broken glass and put his slippers on. He unlatched the bedroom door. He swung his pistol out and aimed downstairs before following his extended arm out onto the landing. He went slowly down the stairs. There was a body in the hall. The man had managed to crawl a little way before expiring. He walked past the corpse and looked into the main hallway that ran the length of the building. It was empty. He waddled gamely to Jim's bedroom. A body lay in what looked in the moonlight like a puddle of water. He knew it was blood. Then he saw Jim. Oh dear, he muttered as he went to him. A hypodermic was sticking out of his leg, which Stafford removed. He took Jim's pulse, which was strong, then called Smith. We're already on the way, said Smith. Two of my men have been seriously assaulted outside your house. A fast boat is heading down the Thames with seven heavily armed men in it. Colonel Brown is on board and being held captive. I'm in control here. Got that, Smith hung up. Jim was only partially aware that he was walking. Stafford was struggling to steer him down the hall. They careered into a guest bedroom and towards the double bed. Stafford let him drop onto it then picked up his feet and pushed him further into the middle. You rest there. I'll deal with Smith when he comes. Jim didn't hear him. Jane was in some kind of crate. She was handcuffed in a fetal position, and there was a mask over her face. She felt as if she was dreaming, but knew from the pain in her wrists that she was at least partially awake. The machine that monitored her vital signs noticed the increase in activity and pumped more of the drug into her. She lost consciousness. Chapter 46 Smith was pacing around the shattered lounge. You mean to tell me you know nothing about this? Not exactly, said Stafford. But it's clear to me that this is not about Jim. It's about Jane. They took her and left him. That fact is patently obvious. Are you suggesting the group of Yakuza who attacked you on the Strand were a different group from the Japanese who stormed you tonight and who are unconnected again with a one-armed Japanese guy who happens to be the Japanese Emperor's curator? Is he now, said Stafford. How interesting. Look, Bertie. Stafford gave him a look of displeasure. There are bodies strewn all over the place. Two of my men sat outside, have been attacked and disabled. You have to tell me what's going on. You know I can't. I don't care if you are MI-10, and I don't care if it's a national secret. I need to know. I don't care about the DIA, either. You simply have to tell me. I can't, said Stafford. You will. John, there is something you need to know. Go on. If I tell you what's happening, your own life will be at great risk. Smith stared at him down his once-broken nose. Tell me, how could that be? I'm afraid we're involved in something so big that nobody can be considered safe or indispensable. Go on. I have nothing more to say. Stafford, do you think I care for one moment about being in danger? You know the score between Jim, Jane, and me. Frankly, I'm pissed off that I'm frozen out here. You have my word that in the circumstances you are best left in the dark. Smith looked around the room and thought. Indeed, he had seen nothing like it. He couldn't imagine what could be so dangerous that he wasn't safe knowing about it. But then, he couldn't imagine what could have unleashed this tidal wave of violence, either. It didn't make any sense. Whatever it was, it certainly couldn't be about some antiques. Chapter 47 The top floor of Kim's headquarters was famous. It was taken up with his private zoo. 
The building was renowned across Japan as the most opulently extravagant of any in the nation. He was the biggest property magnate in Tokyo, and it was a symbol of his power and wealth. It was part of the bluff that his wealth was so great that all his creditors were secure in their investment with him. He would seldom allow visitors, and then only if they were the most influential of people, and then again only if they had something he wanted. The keepers were Koreans with families in the north. Those who knew realized he had business tendrils that stretched over the 42nd parallel into that brooding, malevolent country. The source of his initial capital and the lack of substantiation of his personal history was always a topic of conversation among his detractors, but it hadn't held him back. What held him back was debt, a two trillion yen financial black hole. With a regalia, he told himself yet again, he would escape from his increasingly unbearable burden. With it, he would pay off all his debts. He chopped the fish liver, his hands in surgical gloves, then added it to a small mound of minced Kobe beef, which he rolled into meatballs. He went to the lift from his office suite to the floor above. Whenever he entered the zoo, the CCTV that monitored all the animals went off. The screens on the tenth floor would go blank the moment he stepped out of the lift. His enjoyment of the animals was not for others to watch. The cages were bare, like prison cells without beds. Each animal sat in an antiseptic space, bars on all sides, with perhaps a ledge to jump up on or a bar to swing from. Kim walked past the hyena. Its paws made a scampering sound as it turned so that its eyes could follow him up the aisle. The cheetah in the next cage was pacing in circles and figures of eight. It didn't pay any attention to him. The lion watched him pass. Kim stopped by the Tasmanian devil's cage and watched for a moment. It, too, was circling its cage, marching in its piggy way in a never-ending circuit. The tiger's cage, the biggest, was at the far corner of the floor. She rose as Kim approached. She looked at him, the pupils in her brown eyes, tight elliptic slits. Kim opened the food door and put the bowl in. He closed the door. The bowl popped into the cage and slid a little across the floor. The tiger looked at the bowl, and then at Kim. She stepped over to it and sniffed. She ate. Kim watched and waited. The tiger swayed and began to pant. She sat back on her haunches and batted her eyes as if surprised at something. Her mouth dropped open, and there was a thud as she fell forwards onto her side. Kim swiped his cufflinks across the cage lock. There was a clunk, and he opened the door. He knelt by the paralyzed tiger. You are so very beautiful, he said, stroking her warm fur. After he had finished with her, he would serve her at his restaurant, and another occupant would take her place in the cage. The traces of fugu toxin in her muscles would add flavor. Chapter 48 Jim was sitting by the shattered window when Stafford returned with his bag. Give it to me, he said. He took out the necklace and put it on. He arranged his tennis shirt so it fell under it. He held the mirror in one hand and the sword in the other. They've grabbed Jane to swap her for these. She's probably halfway to Japan by now. He put the mirror down and pulled the sword out of the scabbard. I'm going to have to go there and get her back, and I'm going to kill whoever's behind this and stick their head on a spike. Very good, sir, said Stafford, raising an eyebrow. Jim put the sword away. The professor is the key. How so? queried Stafford. I don't know, but he is. Jim's phone rang. Hello? Good morning, Jim Evans, said a Japanese man's voice in clear English. We understand you have lost your lady friend. We would like to help. Is she okay? For a small fee, I'm sure we can locate her and she can be returned to you well and happy. Small fee? Some objects with which you are familiar. Well, that's going to be difficult, isn't it, seeing as you've got her in Japan and the objects are in London? There was a silence. I'm sure these problems can be overcome. He picked up the sword again. First you need to prove to me Jane's alive, then we can talk. She is alive. He was clenching the sword very tightly. Have you thought about how many of your people I have already killed? He hissed. A white light was filling his vision. 
your life expectancy is directly connected to hers. The line went dead. Kim looked at his keyboard. Indeed, he had not considered how many of his men had been killed in trying to secure the regalia. He felt a sensation of unease in his chest. He took the battery out of the phone and dropped the SIM card into the maw of his shredder. It shattered. Jim studied his distorted face in the undulating surface of the mirror. He looked very determined, and there was a hard, mean glint in his eye. He appeared much older in the shimmering silver lens, his face careworn and craggy. Jane had saved his arse in the Congo, and now it was his turn to even the score. She had moved heaven and earth to get to him in the jungle, risking her career and her neck. Without her, he would never have made it out alive. Now it was down to him to save her. He stared at the face in the mirror. He could hardly recognize himself. The driver pulled over and parked. Akira looked around the street nervously. There were two uniformed policemen at Jim's door. He instructed his guards to stay in the car. The police were armed with machine guns. They didn't look very happy as he approached. I'm here to see Evan's son, he said. Is he expecting you? Yes. The older and fatter of the policemen buzzed through to the house and explained. Stafford came to the door. You'd better come in, he said to Akira. Even though Stafford had cleared up the mess, Akira immediately noticed something was awry in the house. A breeze was blowing up the corridor in the lounge as he passed the door, was in a shambolic state. Stafford showed him into a study where Jim sat brooding. What has happened, Evan's son? said Akira, his horror written on his face. We got attacked last night. They took Jane. Oh no, said Akira. Do you still retain the regalia? Yes, said Jim. And you will trade it for her? Yes, said Jim. I must beg you not to. I know, said Jim. I will if I have to. There was a silence. But, said Jim, I have a deal for you. Anything in my power. If you take me to Japan and find Jane, I will give you one object. If I can rescue her, I will give you another. If we get back here alive, I will give you the sword Kusanagi. Akira stood, his head bowed. His eyes were closed, and he was thinking. I agree. There may be a way. He opened his eyes. Jim was holding Kusanagi, the back of his hand pressed to his lips. Good, he said. Prepare to leave immediately. And the regalia? Stafford had entered the room without Akira noticing. I will make sure it's safe. Why Stafford had decided he needed the Maybach limousine, Jim didn't understand. They didn't use it because cabs were so much more convenient than negotiating the well of a car around London. Getting it out of the underground parking bay was bad enough. The huge vehicle seemed to have a giant momentum, and Jim suspected that Stafford had had it bulletproofed. They were heading for Heathrow and a Virgin Atlantic flight to Tokyo. The Gulf Stream couldn't make it in one hop to Japan, so a commercial flight was best. The professor was shouting into his phone. Whoever was at the other end was getting both barrels. Gone was the respectful, polite little curator. He had been replaced by a rabid wolf. He was growling and shouting at the top of his voice. We have been betrayed, he said after hanging up. Everything I've relayed is relayed on, and people are knowing what should be secret. I've demanded carte blanche. That way we will not have to revert for permission. What does that mean? It means I can do as I please and get what I demand. Great, said Jim. Akira's shorthand was twisted into a claw. It is the only way. Chapter 49 Kim ran his hand over the naked woman. She had an impressive figure, muscled and honed, the body of an athlete. It was covered with many interesting scars. How had this woman come by these divots and little white lines? She might be dangerous. That was unexpected, but delightful. He felt her stir and pulled his hand away. She began to move and he stepped back. She was waking up. How was that possible? He walked out of the cage and closed it, growling with frustration. She must be very strong to recuperate so quickly. He looked at her through the bars. 
She was even more beautiful than the tiger. Jane always thanked God when she woke up after seeing action. One day she would go to sleep and not wake up, and she sometimes wondered whether she would have to forego admission to the nice place. She sat up on a low-tiled platform and planted her feet on a ceramic floor. She was naked, but not cold. A gorilla was gazing at her through the bars of the next cage. Where the hell was she? She looked out of the window and glimpsed Mount Fuji in the far distance. Tokyo, she thought. She climbed off the platform and sat on the floor by the gorilla, her head slowly clearing. Looking mournful, she made eye contact with it. It didn't seem necessary to force herself to think about why she was here. She was in some zoo, and that was weird enough to contemplate with her barely functioning mind. The gorilla was female, she thought. They regarded each other. Who would have a zoo up a skyscraper? Maybe she had died and gone to hell after all. The gorilla took a bar in its right hand, and she gripped the one next to it. Looking into the gorilla's sad brown eyes, she sensed its gentle soul. For a fragmentary moment, she remembered herself as a little child. A lot had changed since then. She got to her feet and went to the window behind the bars. She stared out to the snow-capped peak. What was it about Jim and her and volcanoes? Was it a cosmic irony or evidence of dead pixels in the sky? She pressed her head against the bars. They were too close together for it to fit through. No point forcing your body through a gap if your head can't follow. She sat down again beside the gorilla and held the bar once more. The gorilla grasped the one next to her hand. She wondered how tame it was. Jim hadn't flown much in a traditional way and wasn't used to the delays and security of an airport. When he wanted to fly somewhere, he rolled up to his jet, got on, and took off. At the other end, they looked at his passport and waved him through. His projectile progress from urchin to mega rich had spat him out of the East End into another world where common realities only occasionally intersected with his life. The normal world felt somehow refreshing, like a breeze blowing through an open door into a stuffy room. He wandered into an electronics store, the professor in tow, and looked at the cameras. It was all so normal. It felt good. Heathrow was heaving with travelers milling about. They headed for the Virgin Lounge. When they went in, Jim found it a bit strange, like the sort of place he might create a speck for if he was drunk. You could get a free haircut there, or sit in a chair hung from the ceiling. It had a kind of upmarket cafe in it, and at the door a man offering to polish his shoes. There was a pool table at the far end, and big flat-screen TVs everywhere. What are we going to do when we get to Tokyo, he said as a waiter left with an order for a sausage roll and a beer for him, a plate of sushi and a cup of green tea for the professor. Akira flexed the fingers on his short arm. We will visit an old friend and then we will see. What will we see? Akira closed his eyes. Evan's son, I must find your lady, and to do that, I have only one plan, and that is to see my friend. And if it doesn't work? If that does not work, then the kitsune will have to show us the way. He gazed blankly, but sadly at Jim. Kitsuna? The celestial spirit that guides me. Jim wanted to put a finger in his ears and try to fish out whatever had made him hear what the professor had just said. Right, he replied. I get it. What was he going to do if the professor's friend came up blank? Akira wanted to explain to Jim that he wasn't a religious man, but Shinto beliefs permeated his life, just as Christianity saturated Jim's environment. He had seen a kitsuna, and it had spoken to him, just as Jesus would speak to a typist in Birmingham. He threw coins into the box at the Meiji Shrine, clapped to the gods, and never expected an empty heaven to reply. Now he had been sent to bring back the sacred items of the gods, and they were manifest. Akira looked down at his feet. It is difficult, he said. Jim nodded. It really is, he said. Who is your friend? His name is James Dean Yamamoto. Jim's eyes widened. Holy shit, he said, slumping back in his seat. Yamamoto's son is a powerful man, said Akira, pursing his lips defiantly. His connections run through all Tokyo, from Kagoshima to Hokkaido. 
Jim couldn't help but smile. Okay, he said, but you know I'm totally depending on you. In the circumstances, I believe I am depending on you. The guard put a plate of sushi into the trap and pushed it into the cage. He followed it with a flask. Jane was standing by the bars, her hands demurely over her crotch. The guard was young, stupid-looking, and sweaty. His eyes darted all over her naked body. She smiled a little. His eyes glinted. He was flirting with her from a position of absolute power. She, on the other hand, was flirting with him from a position of utter powerlessness. He moved closer to the bars, a lascivious grin spreading across his face. So this was the boss's new game. Perhaps he could play it for a while. The gold wires holding his teeth in place twinkled through the saliva. She lifted her hands up to cover her breasts. He looked down. She grabbed his head through the bars and smashed his face into the steel. He didn't sag enough, so she smashed his face again into the blood-splattered steel cage. He fell. No pass, no keys, no phone, she cursed. She stripped off his shirt and was removing his trousers when she heard running feet and the sudden howling of the animals. She got the trousers on just in time. The two new guards looked down in horror at their comrade. His nose was spread right across his face, and blood was pouring out of it, his mouth, and ears. He was out cold. She was doing up the gray shirt as she watched them. If the second guard moved a couple of inches further, she was going to give him a nasty surprise. Then he did. She grabbed him by the shirt collar and smashed his face into the bars. Her grip broke, and the guard fell, groaning. The other man jumped back and looked at her aghast as she did up the last of the buttons. The shirt was a bit small for her. The trousers were a bit big and short in the leg, but it was better than being buck naked. She wondered about reaching through the bars and killing the first man, but thought better of it. She picked the plate up and gave the sushi a sniff. The guard struggled off in a kind of shamed silence. She sat down by the bars of the gorilla enclosure. The gorilla was watching her. She gave it a pout and watched the gorilla scratch its black furry shoulder. Then it picked up some straw and threw it gently into the air. She ate the sushi and examined the plate. It was metal. She would sharpen its edges and make it into a lethal weapon. She put down the wooden chopsticks. Yet more raw materials. It was dark outside and the lights of Tokyo gleamed in the heavy rain. Kim watched the monitor, fascinated but horrified. The waiter brought him his plate, a live fish, its side stripped, sliced, and laid out. He watched the fish panting and shivering as he ate its flesh. Its eye twitched back and forth as it suffered its slow, agonizing death. Could it see Kim looking down on it? Jane lifted her head. The floor had gone silent, but for heavy footsteps coming towards her. The gorilla ambled over to her and strained to see what was on its way. Jane felt its big hand touch her shoulder. It was huffing. A short, fat guy walked past the gorilla cage to her enclosure. Jane put her hand on the gorilla's. She glanced laconically to the figure by the cage. He was standing well back. She pouted at the gorilla, an expression it seemed to relate to. Jane kind of related to it as well. You, said the man finally in a sharp voice. Jane left it for a few seconds. You talking to me? she said. Yes, you. She rolled forwards from the gorilla's touch. It huffed anxiously. Me, she said. Who are you? That's a hell of a funny question, she said, moving to the bars. If only he would step a few inches closer. He didn't. You will not attack my guards again, he snapped. Sure, she said. No problem. She was wondering if the plate would fly like a lethal frisbee once she'd hacked it. Unlikely. She probably wouldn't get time to do anything fancy. Hostages got dead pretty quick in her experience. Her chances of survival were dropping exponentially with time. You know, she said, you should probably let me go. If you do, I won't kill you. If not, I can't promise. I ask you again, who are you? I shouldn't worry about me. I'm just a gal. You should worry about my boyfriend. If I am given the regalia, I will let you leave. Okay, said Jane. Give me your mobile and I'll organize it. 
He looked at her sullenly. Don't frustrate me. Frustrate you? I'm sorry. Why don't you come in here? I can fix that frustration for you. I can make this very unpleasant for you. Really, she said. That's interesting. But can I ask you something? She looked at him from the left eye, then the right, then both, scanning up and down his body. He recoiled. How do you want to die? She let the question hang in the air. Because right now, I think I'll be able to grant you that wish. She nodded. Yep. You should let me go. She sat down by the gorilla cage and took hold of the bar. The gorilla clutched the one just above her hand. Kim was bright red with rage. He could shoot her. He could drug her. He could have her bound and gagged. He would have to think of something much worse that would yet leave him with a bargaining chip. Chapter 50 Jim was cursing himself. The professor had told him categorically that the bus was the best way into Tokyo. It hadn't occurred to him that he was being cost-conscious rather than picking the quickest route. It was early morning. The robot voice in the coach was telling him not to use his mobile because it would annoy the neighbors, but his phone didn't connect with the Japanese system anyway. Without his phone, he felt as if a limb had been severed. It was like losing his voice. His satellite phone was in his bag in the belly of the coach. It had helped save his life in Congo and might have to do so again in Tokyo. The door buzzer sounded and Stafford looked at his iPhone. Smith was outside. He prepared himself for a grilling. Good evening, John. To what do I owe this pleasure? Smith was carrying a heavy bag. He sniffed. Can I come in? Of course. Smith walked past him and into the lounge. Repairmen have been quick. The view was a little blurred, and the ladder to the window was gone. The best bulletproof glazing money can buy, said Stafford. Good, said Smith. He swung the hold all onto the ancient Roman table. You don't mind if I stay the night, do you? Stafford was a little startled, but quickly recovered himself. Of course not. Smith unzipped the bag. I brought some party things. He lifted out a short machine gun and held it toward Stafford. My word, he said. This is a beast. I take it we're expecting visitors. Smith sniffed again. I think so. He took a handkerchief from his pocket and blew his nose. I apologize if I give you my cold. That's perfectly all right. Where's Jim? I'm sure you know. I hope he knows what he's doing. I doubt it. I pieced it all together. Good. Smith took out his own machine gun, ejected the magazine, and replaced it. I hope you realize that London's swarming with criminals from every corner of the Far East. We've been stopping them at immigration all day, but we can't have gotten every last one. So, it'll be just the two of us here, hold up against an overwhelming foe? What do you expect when I've got no backstory to tell my lords and masters? I see your point, Stafford cocked the machine gun. Did I do that right? Yes, said Smith, taking the mini back and uncocking it. He handed Stafford two odd-looking snub pistols. These new Berettas pack a good punch. Fragmentation rounds. Stafford took the handguns. A bit modern for me. You'll catch on. Do you think we'll be attacked tonight? Let's just say I don't fancy a bottle of Jim's fine wine this minute. We'll need to be wide awake till further notice. Stafford seemed put out. I wish Jim would stop playing with these people's currencies. He's clearly annoyed them this time. Smith looked hard at him. That's a pretty good blag, but it doesn't wash with me. Whatever you lot are up to, it must be a total mare. I really do dread to think. He took out ammunition and stacked it on the table. If it does kick off, my boys should come running, but you never know. How about yours? Stafford shook his head. I rather doubt it. Smith raised his eyebrows. You will tell me what this is about after it's all over, won't you? Of course. Jim's trading battle screens flashed into life. A virtual bell began to ring, and a chart of the yen appeared. The forex market was going crazy, and the yen was knifing down. Chapter 51 The pretty young secretary trotted quickly into Yamamoto-san's office. She held a plastic tray in both hands. Yamamoto smiled at her, his eyes friendly and paternal. 
The tray contained a book barely held together by decayed old rubber bands. It was his accounts from his shady days. The boy Akira flashed into his mind. Oh, he said long and low, and picked up the relic of his past. Who brought you this? A Professor Nakabashi and his friend present their compliments and ask if they may see you. Yamamoto nodded slowly and got up. Please bring them in to me. His round, lined face was suddenly shiny with perspiration. Akira was here. Akira, the honored imperial curator, the esteemed professor, his determined little friend from his previous half-forgotten shadowy world. Akira was part of his past life as an outlaw, a life that was, in practice, only just submerged below the surface of a successful businessman. He supported himself on his desk. He'd always wanted to see Akira again, but his new life precluded it. As he had risen in wealth, standing, and legitimacy, so had Akira's prestige. It had never seemed fitting that Yamamoto should reestablish contact. It seemed not in the best interest of his lost friend, the renowned Professor Nakabashi. He could not risk embarrassing or compromising Akira. Yet now, Akira was here, the plucky one-armed kid who had carried his nefarious packages to his no-good clients. Those were the days. He stood upright as his office door opened. He recognized Akira immediately, not from his pictures in the media, but from the remnants of the child in his face and by the signature of his stunted arm. A tall American was with him. Yamamoto-san, said Akira, it is so good to see you. Yamamoto felt a tear roll down his face. Akira, he said, embracing him, it's been so long. Akira was surprised and clearly moved. James Dean, son, it has been too long. It has been forever. Yamamoto looked up at the American and blinked. I'm Jim. He was Australian. This is Evan's son, said Akira, from England. Yamamoto, he pulled himself together and bowed. Jim Evans, said Jim, bowing awkwardly. We need your help, James Dean, son, said Akira. We are in desperate straits. Anything, Akira, anything in my power, what is it? My friend Jim's girlfriend has been kidnapped and is here somewhere in Japan. Kidnapped? By someone very powerful, very, very powerful. Oh, muttered Yamamoto. I'm hoping that you can help us find her. She is American. He took a photo from his inside jacket pocket. The picture showed a woman soldier crawling under barbed wire. She was very pretty. Kidnapped here in Tokyo? He was confused. No, in London, but brought here. Yamamoto looked incredulously at Akira. Kidnapped in London and brought to Tokyo? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Interesting. Can you help? Yamamoto was staring out of the window. Yes. How can we repay you? Yamamoto laughed. You can't, Akira. Not unless you have a spare ten billion yen. Maybe in a couple of years you can buy some Raymond noodles for a broke old man. Perhaps Evanson can help you while you look for his girlfriend. Mrs. Yamamoto had about 30,000 pounds in her Forex trading account. It looked like she had started with 150,000, but had traded it away. For everyone but Jim, Forex trading was a random game where you won and lost on a 50-50 basis, but chewed through your capital with broker expenses. The trading software was configurable in every conceivable language. Helping people trade away their savings with Forex was a huge worldwide business, and with gambling restricted in most countries, it was a proxy for the slot machine or the roulette wheel. He clicked the link, and the software was in English. Damn, said Jim, inspecting the yen chart. That's going up. The account had a hundred times leverage, which meant that fifty grand could represent five million. All in, he said, buying five million in yen. Ten minutes later, the yen was up 1.5 percent. Mrs. Yamamoto's account registered a profit equivalent to 15 million yen, about $150,000. Yamamoto's eyes bugged out. Akira stood impassively behind him. Let's do that again, said Jim, this time shorting. The yen seemed to collapse just after the trade went on. Shit, said Jim. This is like shooting fish in a barrel. What is he doing, whispered Yamamoto. 
as another 10 million yen profit popped onto the screen. Trading well, said Akira, quietly. I can see that. It's as if he's telling the yen what to do next. He is a professional. Professional. If professional traders could do this, they would own the world. They do, murmured Akira. Yamamoto didn't know how to respond. Traders might own the world, but even they could not trade like this. The Englishman had tripled the account in twenty minutes. I will follow up with my people, he said, his eyes still riveted to the trading screen. Any chance of a cup of tea? called Jim. And have you got any antacid tablets? My stomach's killing me. He laughed. Look at that! Blimey! Bombs away! Something really is screwing up the yen. Then he realized it was probably him and his stupid demand for untold billions of dollars in return for the regalia. The news and associated mutating rumors were flying around the market creating financial carnage. Was the bill a hundred trillion now? Were they talking about nuclear weapons hidden in Japan instead of a few mythical artifacts? Whatever the news had become, it was causing consternation and panic. A motorcade of silent police bikes was making its way around the Imperial Palace. It was heading for Yamamoto Tower. In a pouch, there was a letter, no text, with the chops of the Emperor and the Prime Minister at the bottom. Chapter 52 Eating dog in Japan wasn't against the law, but it was rare. The way he had it prepared, though, was illegal. Tradition held that dog meat was healthy, and Kim enjoyed it, particularly if it was from the right place and was prepared correctly. The dogs were flown in from Korea in small versions of what he used for human cargo. To the outside world, Kim was a highly successful property tycoon. But the engine of his empire, the business that generated the cash he leveraged into bricks and mortar, was smuggling. His illicit gains from trafficking had funded his property empire. Clandestine money gave him the edge, letting him outbid all comers in the legitimate world and kept him from going broke. Japanese business relied on borrowing huge sums of money at negligible interest rates, which made it easy to hide financial realities. Money borrowed at 1% could be squandered without anyone realizing it was gone and would never be repaid. You could repay 1% of the capital for decades without anyone suspecting the bulk was long gone. Borrowing money at 1% was a never-ending financial merry-go-round. 1% interest rate loans need never be repaid or shown to be in default. In the financial environment when all businesses were addicted to massive levels of debt at low interest, it was hard to see that Kim's deals didn't make commercial sense and that other sources of money had to be keeping his sprawling property empire afloat. But, even with his vast illegal earnings, the property still didn't make financial sense. He was slowly being crushed by the economic Godzilla of Japan, deflation. Japan had suffered deflation for two decades. Simply put, prices fell in Japan. Every year, things got cheaper, which meant in its turn that every year debt got bigger, because the money owed became more valuable. The Japanese economy had been on the rack of deflation, unable to escape its vicious circle since the asset bubble crash of the late 80s that had seen the land of the Emperor's Palace become, at one stage, worth more than all the real estate in California. It had been followed by a crash from which the economy had never bounced back. Kim's property empire had been crumpled by cycles of deflation and he was indebted to such an extent that even the proceeds of his global crimes couldn't bail him out of an impending commercial implosion. He smuggled people, money, and now, as his financial pressures worsened, drugs and animals. The drug trade was profitable, but the linchpin of his operation was still smuggling people to and from North Korea. He ferried in people and shipped out the fake dollar bills and euros that the North Koreans printed. Smuggling rare animals had started as a sideline, a symptom of his desperation for cash. But it had also become a hobby, then an obsession. Exotic animals and their body parts were highly prized, and Kim shipped them wherever they needed to go. Meanwhile, it allowed him to indulge himself with his zoo. The animals were his only passion. People meant nothing to Kim. 
They were like puppets to be bent and twisted to his plans. His masters, North Korea, always needed a fresh supply of people to teach languages. They especially needed Japanese, but they also needed Europeans and Americans. North Korea needed kidnap victims to teach its spies their languages. It was of utmost importance to know exactly what the enemy was saying and be able to transplant agents with fluent local language skills into the countries it wanted to monitor. Foreigners never lasted long in the North. Before they could acclimatize enough to have a hope of escape, they were done away with. Because of this, Kim was tasked with providing a constant supply of new tutors. This meant he had to capture and smuggle more than a 100 people every year to North Korea. It was a huge task, paid for in gold, fake money, and in kind. He had run the operation ever since he was a young man sent to Japan to spy on Tokyo, and now, 35 years on, he could not stop. For sure, he didn't want to. He had to make his empire financially solid again. He had delivered living flesh into North Korea for most of his life. He wasn't scared of that business. It was the drug running he feared. There were many clever enemies to confound him in that business, and at some point they would make a breakthrough. His edge was that his operations were manned by North Koreans. Back in North Korea, his workers' families lived or died on his command. So while his smuggling ring spanned the globe, his security was absolute. Now if he could capture the imperial regalia, he could buy his way out of his predicament and perhaps, at last, disengage from his more dangerous activities. One day, bad luck would catch up with him and destroy the facade. With the risks he was now taking, that moment could not be far away. This might be his last opportunity to escape the noose of his karma. The dog tasted good. Before it had died, it had hung by its broken legs, trussed up in his restaurant's kitchen for two days. It would be tender and have the special taste that only animals that die in torment develop. The thought of its suffering gave him comfort and peace.